Welcome back, everyone, to the long-awaited second episode of the Phasic Tipton Focus podcast. We are pleased to be joined by Bill Simon today of WSS Racing. We've got a lot of topics to cover here today, so thanks for tuning in. And, Bill, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, terrific. Glad to be here. I want to talk a little bit about your background first. You have a, a varied background. I believe I read that you got your degree in economics from Connecticut and an MBA as well. Uh, you were with Walmart for a number of years. You were with PepsiCo. Uh, and, and Nabisco, is that correct? So just talk about a, a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I did do undergrad at University of Connecticut, UConn. Um, went in the active duty in the Navy for five years. Stayed in the reserves, another 19, but left active duty, uh, went to graduate school, and started a business career that had been has been wonderful for me. Uh, did a, you know, tour through a whole bunch of really interesting companies, um, RJR Nabisco, Pepsi, um, a British uh, wine and spirits company called Diageo, um, did some service in the in the uh, public sector too. I, I was the secretary of the Florida Department of Management Services when Jeb Bush was governor. He was my boss. That was exciting and interesting too. And then I started at Walmart and had a very nice career there. So what was the most fun that you had there? You mentioned spirits. Did you get to like do samples with Nabisco and PepsiCo? And what, I mean, what was the most, uh, the most fun you had with those companies? Well, I'll tell you what the most interesting story was. It was probably my second or third day um, at Nabisco. And I was working on the, the, the uh, candy bar brand, Baby, Baby, Baby Ruth. Yeah. And my very first day, we, we go in and they're testing out a new peanut you know, then we're going to do a honey roasted baby Ruth. Now, that, that doesn't sound good. I don't know what does. <laughs> and I walk in and there's like six samples sitting there on the table. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like, so I start eating one and I start eating the next one. And by the time I get to the third one, I, I don't know if I can make it through these six. <laughs> and by the, I look over and everybody else around the table is like, got a spit bucket and they're looking at me like I'm some sort of crazy <laughs> man. You know, so. Well, which, I mean, did any of them, were any of them successful? Did you... Did your vote count in that? I never made it to number four, five, and six, so I don't know. I, you know, they, I think we launched it as a promotion, and it probably didn't work. There was this honey roasted phase, and then people realized they have like about fifty million calories, so they didn't, they didn't make it. <laughs> now, are you from Connecticut originally? How did you end up at, at UConn? Yeah, um, my family. I was I was born in Connecticut. Um, went to UConn, finished high school there. Went to UConn and uh, joined the Navy. Met my beautiful wife when I was in the Navy, and we both went back to graduate school and went out and started a career. Excellent. Excellent. How do the Huskies prospect look this year? Obviously, we're clearly in wildcat country here, but but the Huskies have a very storied basketball team as well. How are we looking? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's going to be another good year. Five, five national championships since 1999. My wife, you know, she's a Tar Heel, so oh, we've had some oh basketball boy. wars in the house as well. Um and now we're spending a lot of time here in in Lexington, so it's gonna be it's gonna be dicey during basketball season. Is that where the silks colors come from? You kind of exactly have like the right. dark Yukon and got, then the the we, Tar Heel blue on the silks yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Navy blue and the Tar Heel blue. Beautiful. Yep. Beautiful. And Tammy's joining us in studio. Jeez. I don't know if you, you guys might be able to hear him in the background. And Jared Hughes, who has helped you out, pick a few of these horses that we're going to talk about today. So more you, than a few. More than. <laughs> You started. Uh, you started in horse racing. It looks like, or, or with ownership anyway. Just looking at Equibase, about 2017 in partnerships. Is is that about right? Yeah, we did. We had some very good friends. Um, a, a guy named Hootie Moore, who has Hootie's Racing. Um, you know, really great friends of ours from Arkansas. Uh, got us into interested in racing. Um, you know, after a long business career with a lot of travel and time away from my my wife and family. I wanted to do something that we, my wife and I could do together. And so we bought in a partnership on one horse in 2017. And then, you know, just like everybody else, I got addicted. I got addicted to, you know, the horses are beautiful, but I still have a hard time telling the bays from the chestnuts, if you want to know the <laughs> truth. But on a spreadsheet and on a P&L and on a, on a pedigree and on a racing form, I see numbers. I sort of like, that's my thing. That was going to be the, the next question I have. How did you end up with racing? You said you wanted to kind of do it as a family thing with, with you and Tammy together. So why, why did you get to racing? How did you get to racing from your, from your corporate background? You know, it, it's, it's, I, it was something that we, I wanted to try. I've 
always sort of watched it from afar and been interested in it, trying to figure out how to, you know, solve this r really unsolvable problem, um, like an equation, like how does this all work? And it, the more I, you know, sort of like you pull a thread and then you start pulling a thread and the next thing you know, you pulled out a whole, you know, quilt and I haven't got that far yet. And so I'm still pulling. I like that. That's a great analogy. You're still pulling. Just you, you talked about looking at the numbers and the and the dollars and cents of it. What have you? What were you able to take from your background in business to bring over to, to horse racing? Well, I think the first thing for me is if you don't have a plan in horse racing, if you don't have some sort of a strategy that you're trying to execute, you can spend a whole bunch of money and get absolutely nowhere as an owner. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes I watch some of the some of the things that go on. Like we we were just at the Saratoga sale where we. We're really, really happy with what we ended up getting, and I think sometimes it's a it turns into a competition between not not the horses, but between the bidders. Sure, and yeah. I think that's what what you guys are trying to you know manage, and 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 I'm happy for you, but I can't play that game. <laughs> yeah, um, and so for me, it's like you know how do you how do you participate in this world where you, you see people do illogical things, or at least illogical from a P and L and a business perspective, and. I'm constantly scratching my head or turned into Jared and saying something like, how's that going to work mathematically? How, you know, they just paid $2 million for whatever. And, you know, you're going to have to win the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but know. it's what the game is built on, right? It's the competition. It's, right. it's that, that competitive spirit that, that it's built on that you talk about that happens in the auction ring with that competition. Exactly, exactly. It's what the game is built on. So you started in partnerships in 2017, what led to you kind of stepping out on your own? And, and it looks like maybe 2019 was the first time you started owning horses solo. Right. Now we still have some horses with our partners. They're, you know, more, more of our friends and, and, and enjoy the, those interactions. But I, I started, you know, working very closely with Jared, trying to figure out a plan, a strategy on how, how we could do this. I, like I, we're buying pieces of horses and shares and we're, you know, it, it's, it felt more like, random luck than anything, any strategy that we were trying to execute. So spent a lot of time, you know, use, using analogies to, you know, to business building a bond ladder for all intents and purposes. You know, we started buying weanlings um, instead of two-year-olds in training, um, you know, and then built a ladder where we sort of buy some weanlings, evaluate them, sell some good ones to pay for the ones that we're keeping and buy some, you know, then we need a replacement at, a, at the yearling because we need a long turf filly. Um, and, and so we start filling in there and then use the two-year-old sale to, to kind of finish off the, the crop um, and, and sort of using those business thoughts to try to build our, our you know, our, our racing team. And did you develop that plan just after being in it and with, with the ownership aspect of it, any desire to breed horses at all or? Well, you know, we, we tried a lot of different things. We started buying two year olds in training, I think was my first horse. Then we got into the, some claiming and had some success with a, you know, a grade three winner named Honey Money. Um, we claimed for $16,000 and it, it was all interesting to me and it was all learning and I'm constantly running math equations in my head saying, well, this won't work. You know, if we keep doing this and this won't work or this will work. And I finally got to the point where I sort of figured what, how I think we can kind of do this. And the, the objective is to be sustainable over the long run so that you don't, you know, burn yourself up either emotionally sure. or financially and have to get out. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do. So your approach was just kind of do a, a lot of different things at first, figure out what you key in on. And so far, right. you've had a lot of success buying not only weanlings, we'll talk about that in a minute, weanlings, but yearlings as well. Correct. And then the, through the claiming game, and you just kind of identified that this is, we're going to go the weanling route a little bit this year or, or, or whatever that might be. Well, we now buy, you know, our, our plan is typically to buy a group uh, of weanlings, um, uh, evaluate, sell some, you know, fill ins at, at the yearling sale and then finish them off at the two year old sale and then, you know, rinse and repeat. Yeah. So you, you had a, you started in 2019 kind of on your own. You had a massive year in, in 2021, I believe it was. You had four times the earnings you had in 2021 than you did in, in 2020. So you came out with a big year. 
Part of that was Joyful Cadence. Part of that was Barbara Road, who was, was that your first Derby starter? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's a $15,000 weanling that Jared picked out for us. So and this algorithm you're talking about, there's something, there's something to this equation that you've developed. It's, it's math. It's math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It works. Yeah. What, what was the progression like to, to have a horse like that, that you purchased for 15,000 as a weanling. And then there you are in the, arguably the biggest day in racing in the world uh, on the first Saturday in May, watching this horse run in your colors. You know, it's so, it's so hard to describe to people who haven't had that experience and for people who've had it, they don't need it described. Uh, you know, I, I tried to say things. I, I've had, I've been so blessed in my life to be, have been able to do some incredible things, you know, at Walmart. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've done, I've, I've worked for, you know, the governor of Florida and, you know, met his family and I'm never, ever nervous, but you get out there and you make that walk um, uh, on Derby Day and you just, you realize how, just awe-inspiring that that is, and you realize why this sport is special. It's special not because of the people, not only because of the people, but because of the animals and the experience and the and the tradition. And it's 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 really not describable. I was honestly, I'm very very rarely speechless. I can't, in fact, I can't remember any other time I've been speechless. It seems like that that emotion or, or that 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 being that state of being is, is a pretty frequent thing that you hear from people who win at the elite levels of racing they become speechless and jared tipped me off a little bit he said here's a guy that's met presidents or you, you'd sent him a message you yeah. know i've met presidents i've met foreign leaders princes princesses whatever it might be yeah. uh, ceos of fortune 500 companies but it's the horses that make you the most nervous it, it really is it really is and you know anybody who's looked in, the, in a horse's eye knows that there's something in there and you just you just can't help but stare at it, and I think it's that wonderment that sort of is what is what captivates people. Yeah, and Joyful Cadence was was part of that group as well. Right. Um, she was a horse that that ran in a lot of different places for you. She ran against some some very tough horses, um, and we're going to talk about her being the first mare in full to flight line in uh, the November, November sale at Phasic Tipton. So talk about her campaign and all the places that she got to take you. Yeah, you know she we. I think we first saw her, she was just, and still is, stunningly beautiful. Um, she's just a, what, probably her and, and Brightwork, our, our, our two-year-old filly, are the most beautiful animals I've ever seen. And maybe they are because, I, you know, they're mine and I, and I love them and they made me money. But they really are just absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, we got off to a little bit of a slow start. She, she, didn't, she didn't start, I don't think she started as, as a two-year-old um, you know, had a first out uh, at Turfway where, you know, she was just sort of getting her feet under her and then um, just won her maiden, um, you know, by eight or nine lengths. And just we saw there was really something special there. Um, you know, we immediately took her from there into Stakes Company and she ran really well in the Purple Martin at Oaklawn. She missed uh, the uh, grade three Miss Preakness by, gosh, a bob. And uh, that seemed to have tell her story. She I think she ran 14, 14 times in six furlong races. Twelve of them were, or maybe eleven of them were stakes races. And she never missed the board. Never missed the board. That's amazing. Six furlongs. And she, I think she had four, four or five graded stakes placed, and three or four more listed stakes placed. She was a stakes winner. And she just ran her heart out. She 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 runs and runs. And you know we were gonna keep her in, uh, you know, at the track this year. Um, and you know we finally started to look and see what was going on. And uh, she's had given us so much that we just decided it was time to retire. her. We had the opportunity to to breed her to flight line. You know, arguably the best horse of his generation. Um, and you know, we decided to take that opportunity um, to see what happens because she's a beautiful, beautiful horse. She's half to, you know, the country grammar, the third highest, uh, you know, earning uh, horse in the history of, all time. of racing. Yeah. Um, and she's from a you know, incredible family. Um, pedigree is great. And, you know, like I was, we were talking before, so like if 
two and a half percent of flight line sold for five million. Somebody can buy fifty <laughs> percent of flight line. You know, do that math. I think we're going to be pretty happy. Absolutely. And so you you bought her as a, as a yearling for two thirty five, I think. Correct. And that was before Country Grammar had even started his career. Right. So on top of that, you you get to campaign this filly. You have a ton of fun with her. She she makes over four hundred thousand dollars. I believe it's over four hundred five hundred thousand yeah, five seventy. Yeah, yeah, almost six. So she makes over half a million dollars. You get to enjoy that ride. But then, do you also watch Country Grammar and how he does, and sort of enjoy that ride as well? Well, we started to, you know, yeah. um, it started seeing what was happening there, and uh, you know, became his probably maybe second biggest <laughs> fan. I think I, I won't take it away from his ownership group. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was really nice to see and. I see a lot of I see a lot of her in him in his races now. She sprinted mostly. Um, I think it, that comes from the run happy side of her, uh, but she's got that long graceful stride that he has, and just that same incredible grit that he shows that he showed in the Dubai World Cup. Uh, and so I think you know somebody with that cross with the 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 speed that you get from. A run happy, the durability and the longevity that you get from flight line and country grammar. I mean, that's going to be an incredible baby. Yeah. And, and the cross seems to work as well. I mean, it's, it's a proven cross that she's bred on. You talked about her family. There's Judd Mont runners that are, that are in the family as well. And you get to make history. You're the, you're the first mayor to sell in full to flight line. And it's, it's going to be in the November sale here at Phasic Tipton. I know somebody's going to have to hold my wife back. Uh, she's <laughs> either going to be crying or bidding one of the two. So Maybe a little of both. Maybe yeah. a little of both. But hopefully it's tears of joy. Hopefully it's tears yeah. of joy. And we get to see her horses run on the racetrack many years to come, hopefully. Right. So she, you purchased her as a, as a yearling. Now let's talk to, to Brightwork, who's also a November graduate as well, but a November graduate on the side of she was a, a weanling that was offered here. And you purchased her for 95000 Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, huge pedigree. She's got a, a lovely pedigree as well, as, as does Joyful Cadence. So you switched over at that time to the weanling process. Was she kind of the first group of weanlings that you had bought? or uh, She was in the second group. I think the first group was Barbara Road. Um, and then we started. Part of the reason that you saw the big jump in earnings is that, you know, you follow this weanling strategy. You got you got two years of expenses and no earnings right. um, before you get there. So we were in that process and starting to see that that build its way up. Um, you know, she, uh, Brightwork, you know, it's interesting because as with all the um, notoriety that she's been getting for winning the spin away, somebody posted online the, the sale here at Phasic Tipton when we bought her for 95. And I watched that again just not too long ago. And she was gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, she was, she's just one of the most well put together uh, athletic um, she was as a foal, as a weanling, and she is as a two-year-old horses that I've, I've honestly ever seen. Yeah. So you you get her home. You you part of the evaluation. What was the impetus for keeping her and putting her into training or or selling and pin hooking as you had with with other horses? Well, you we look at her and you go, I mean, this this horse is special, and you know, it's not that I'm a, above selling a special horse. I'm doing it with joyful cadence, but it's got to be, you know. Right circumstances. Right circumstances yeah. and the right price. And so, you know, I think, you know, because of, you know, she's, I think Outwork was just starting to get his feet under him. We just, we just always evaluated the, the fact that she, we look, we thought she was going to be very good and she was, and that we wouldn't be, she wouldn't bring the commercial value at that point that we would want to get for giving her up. And so we, we you know, that wasn't really the discussion and it didn't last very long it was like oh, we're keeping her that's what i was going to ask about the evaluation process not looking for trade secrets or anything how, how your operation works but part of it is does the commercial market come into play with that when you're when you're evaluating the yearlings that you had exactly, purchased as weanlings exa that's exactly what we look at we look at we, we buy one we hope hopefully we buy them well um and then as they develop positively their you know commercial value based on the, you know, their, their siblings, their sire, um, you know, how, how they develop. If the commercial value is substantial, we think we take the money off the table and turn around and buy another one. And that's the model that we're trying to do. Cause when we sell horses, we want to, we don't want to just sell the ones that we don't think are capable because then nobody buys from you. Uh, they don't generate 
the revenue that you need to pay for the rest of the crop, which is really what the objective is here. If we can buy a, a bunch of babies and then sell some of them, some some of the the good ones as well, we can pay for the ones we get to keep and and you know kind of move forward on house money. Yeah, and that's that's sort of what we're trying to do. So the evaluation seemed to work though. She she wins first time out, then eventually you go to Ellis Park. You win a race there. And then you you point towards Saratoga after that. Yeah, we went we won at Ellis Park, but it really should be count, called Churchill. The Churchill at Ellis. Ellis Park. Yeah. If, they were, if we're going to call it Belmont at Aqueduct, um, <laughs> it's, it's Churchill yeah. at Ellis. And um, you know she she ran she ran a great race, and you know it's really been interesting to watch every race. She's four four for four, and has never been the favorite. Um, That's pretty race. amazing. Yeah, it's kind of weird if you think about it. And she has beat some incredible horses. We've We've had we've not shied away from any of it. You know, Crimson Advocate uh, was in her in her maiden race and turned around, you know, next out and won a stakes up north and then went to Royal Ascot, to Royal Ascot and, sure. and won a you know a, a graded race and then you know we our next race we go against Vivi's Dream. Vivi's a great horse. Um, we looked you know looked her in the eye and bright work wasn't given and beat her. Uh, by a half a length and you know then we go up to saratoga and run against some great horses in the adirondack and win that by five lengths and then we come up you know against the you know the horse that everybody said was the horse of the year in ways and means and she's just an incredible beautiful horse um and you know bright work turned her back too so yeah. it's, it's been it's been kind of this uh you know under undervalued over appreciated you know, approach that she's just, and she's just kind of like the, the every man's workday horse. Sure. Um, the just, unsung hero just, to a she degree. She just goes out there, smiles, runs really hard, and is really, she's really enjoying herself. And that's very apparent to see. It's interesting you mentioned the Adirondack. I, I remember that race very vividly because every horse in the race was a winner. Nobody had, had been defeated. There was a couple horses who had been out, but they scratched. But everybody who went to the post, had not been uh, had not been beaten, and that's a pretty rare. Even for two year olds, it's a it's a pretty rare circumstance. That's right. It's cool, and if you really start thinking about it, I think two of them. There was a graded stakes winner in the race. Um, there was another stakes winner in the race. Two horses who, you know, next out won stakes races. So you know that Adirondack, you know, had ended up having four stakes winners plus yeah. bright work in it. Five. That's a that was a really a key race. And then. Then to go from there into the spinaway, um, and you know have that, you know, what well, that was probably the most exciting race I've ever seen. Grade one at Saratoga, and you so you started owning horses in 2017. Did you imagine that you would be at that level that quickly in in the game? I didn't imagine it. No, I I, I had hoped, I had planned. Um, I knew when we got into this, I'm I'm sort of either an all in or an all out guy. I don't mind laying on the sofa and doing nothing. In fact, I like it quite a bit. But when I get off the sofa, I'm in, and I don't want to. I don't want to play around. Um, so you know that was the hope that we could build a business, that we could build a plan that would be able to compete at the top levels in the country. And it's been amazing to watch. There's some incredible horses and some really fabulous trainers, uh, and the people, the ownership groups, the people that we've come across have been. It's 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 this community that I think uh, you know we've really sort of fallen in love with, but that's what I want to do. We want to be able to compete, and, and you know we we've been very purposeful in our selection of a trainer um, that we use. Uh, we purposeful in the people that we deal with on the bloodstock side with Jared Hughes and Hughes Bloodstock. Um, it's because we we don't need this. My wife and I we love this. And so we want to be with people that we like and people that, you know, like us and we can help and then they can, and can help us. And that's really what we, what we have. And it makes the wins that much more special right. when you can do with people that you enjoy being around and, and put in all the, all the work with you. That's right. You mentioned you, you specifically picked John Ortiz and I saw a comment that you made on Twitter, or I guess it's X now, but I'm still going to call it Twitter. Uh, that he's he might be the best kept secret out there. I, I think the secret's out though, Bill. I think people are starting to see his, his capabilities. How did that relationship start with you guys? Well, you know when uh, Hootie and I were, 
you know, really starting to get this thing going, we, we decided we wanted to look, look for trainers. We wanted, um, young people. We're both, you know, very people of faith and, you know, have our views on, you know, what things should be. And that is, I don't mean to say we didn't, we don't like other trainers. I think there's other trainers out there who've been wildly successful. Um, and you know, our, our opportunity in life from where I sit is to help other people. And, you know, if you look at, you know, these great trainers like, you know, Brad Cox and Todd Pletcher, they, they don't need my help. They're already, they're already there. They don't need anything from me and I can't give them anything. But if you take a young person who's just starting out in their chosen career and I can give them one or two good horses that they can't get, and the world can then see the cap the capability and the talent that they have. That's very fulfilling to my wife and I. That's one of the reasons that we're doing this. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I just, I would, I would be awestruck to be with a guy like Todd Pletcher. They're great, great trainers, but he doesn't need me. Um, and he doesn't need my horses. He's got a whole line of horses that are waiting to get in his barn. Um, by being with John, um, I've been able to learn a lot because John has the ability, this innate um, horsemanship that I've just, I've, I've not been around a long, but it's, it's really incredible when you get to see it. Um, and he's willing to share and willing to teach. And for me, that's been really, you know, really fulfilling to see, to see how I've been able to learn, we've been able to learn, and how John's been able to grow in his you know, chosen field. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that's a, a wonderful approach that you have kind of taken the the rise through the ranks with him. I think it was just a few years ago he had his first graded stakes winner was a, a horse on the turf at Keeneland, I believe. Um, and so he's he's kind of risen the ranks with you. That's that's a great great thing to see that you guys are both on the rise. What would you say to somebody who's? I mean, you're still fairly new in the in the industry, but if you have someone that that comes to you to to see and sees the, the level of success that you've had already. What's your piece of advice to them? What do, what do you tell them to do? What's the best entryway into the industry? Well, look around and try a lot of things and then find something that you really like that gives you joy. And, and then, you know, sort of dive into that. Um, I think you find lots of people who come in and they get excited about something and they spend a lot of money at one of your sales um, and it doesn't work because it's so hard, right? Like, I don't know, you're going to sell a how many a thousand horses and you know a hundred of them are going to make money yeah <laughs> or 200 of them are going to make money it, and you can get discouraged um so if it's not bringing you joy you know don't don't do it find the part of this business that makes you the happiest and the part that makes us the happiest is going to training in the morning and watching training and uh, you know when the races happen you know i don't can take or leave the race. In fact, I go, I go for our races, but I, I don't like to sit around and watch the races and handicap other people's horses. Yeah. It's kind of not what we do, but boy, I love to sit at the track in the morning and watch training my horses, everybody's horses, the people. It's therapeutic. It's you know, yeah, it's, it's therapeutic and the kindness, the, 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 the coll collegiality. I don't even know if that's a word. Um, it is now <laughs> of the people <laughs> Uh, is it's really the world could take notice. Yeah. I think collegiality should be the name of your next Weanley purchase from Phasey Tipton. We're, right, we're going to we'll go ahead do, and maybe we'll do we're going to reserve it now. Uh, the jockey club will probably <laughs> tell me it's taken. <laughs> we'll find some form of it. We yeah. might have to like finagle the spelling a little bit, but we'll, we'll find some way to get it in there. Um, well, that's, that's great, but we, we appreciate your time and, and best of luck with bright work on her continued journey. Just real quick, though, what do you consider your home track? You're you're originally from the northeast. What's what's home for you? Home is in my like your home race track. What's your? Oh, it's it's Keeneland. It's here. Yeah. yeah, we've we've got a place now here in Lexington. Great. And uh, you know, anytime we're here, um, it feels like it feels like second home. And uh, you know, for as far as our horses go, this is where they this is where they start, and this is where they spend most of their time training when they're when they're babies, and so. This for for bright work after spending the summer up in Saratoga. This is this is like home and watching her work over the track again after she got back. You know, you could tell she was smiling. Yeah, yeah, blossoming, blossoming yeah. for sure. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Best of luck moving forward. Hope to see you back here in November for the sale and uh, 
best of luck on the continued success. Yeah, thanks much. Appreciate being here. Absolutely. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the Phasic Tipton Focus. We'll see you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.